Um, so really pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Danny Gamal. I'm a clinician and data scientist in the Google Health team. Uh, you might have met some of my colleagues in the room. We're all a group of people really passionate about the NHS, probably more so than we are technology. So we're already you know, looking for ways that we can collaborate, learn and share ideas here. Uh, and so today I just want to share some of our learnings uh, from evaluating fire, clinical data quality with BigQuery and DBT. So I'm sure that Probably everyone in this room has got their hands dirty with data quality. It's not always the most glamorous problems, but it's something that's you know, essential to every model, every project. But it's only really in the last few years, working in Google on our Care Studio product, that I've had to think about data quality at scale. Um, and that's what the, uh, the, the challenges and the learnings from that that I want to share with you today, and also to signpost some of our code that we're hoping to open source uh, very shortly. So in that first slide, I already mentioned four tools that not everyone here will be familiar with, which is probably not the, the best way to start a presentation. So I'm just going to run through at a very high level uh, each of these for grounding. So first things first is we have Care Studio, and this is a tool that we've built at Google uh, that enables clinicians to search over the patient record and extract relevant clinical information for the clinicians. It's built upon a data platform in which we integrate and standardize data from different clinical systems. And so that brings us nicely to the, the second item here, which is FHIR. So this is the data schema that we standardize to. So FHIR, uh, for those who are not aware, is an open international standard for defining a uh, sort of de facto way of representing health data as we share it across systems. Uh, the third one, uh, Bickery, is probably a bit more familiar. This is uh, Google Cloud's enterprise data warehouse. And this is where our data platform uh, lives for uh, analytics. And then the fourth tool along, which you'll hear me uh, mention quite a bit in this talk, is DBT. So DBT is an open source tool written in Python um, that basically sort of knits together your Python scripts, your SQL scripts, and puts them together into a package and a data pipeline. So it's something that really ties in with what, uh, what Sarah was talking earlier about, reproducible analytics pipelines, and we're starting to use that in our work. So, over the last few years, there's been a bit of a shift in the landscape, which I think is a really exciting one for all of us in this room. Uh, clinical data is starting to be liberated at a, at a great scale, of course, with all of the, the necessary IG controls in place. But we're going from what was previously, probably saw lots of this in, in different trusts in different places, this sort of idea of isolated data extracts, ad hoc, pulling and re reproducing data in different places. We're sort of moving away from that to this multi-use data platform, trusted research environment sort of model. So this is great and it has many benefits, but in terms of data quality, it brings some challenges. And these are the challenges that fell on my team and my colleagues. And one of the first challenges when I think about this is that when we think about how we define data quality, what does it mean? Most of the definitions will be something around the adequacy of the data for how it's going to be used. So it's much easier to apply that principle in the, in the sort of data extract isolated project. You know, you know exactly what matters for your model, for your project, you know what doesn't matter, and you might even be able to clean up some of the data yourself in your own extract. As we move to the clinical data platform, we hit other challenges. The first thing is, you know, data's coming from different sources, we're transforming data. So whenever we do that, there's a risk of data loss or clinical misrepresentation. So we need to be on top of that and making sure that's been done correctly. Data might be streaming, it might be dynamic, that brings its own challenges of updates and deletes. Uh, and then also the point I alluded to earlier is by definition, the data platform is multi-use. There'll be lots of different users, different applications, and they all have different requirements. So with this comes different teams, different stakeholders, and potentially even clinical safety implications if applications are built on top. So how have we gone about tackling this? Well, it's, it's broadly a mix of these two factors. So there's, of course, the technical side of things, of you know, how do we measure many things and measure them many times, almost constantly, as the source data is coming in and can change. But like all data science projects, there's always a human side to this. Always need to remember that you know, data doesn't actually do anything by itself. It's just information. So this actually needs to lead to action. So in this talk, we're in a, a technical conference today, so I will go deeper on the, the technical slide. But I'm just going to have one slide just to give an illustration of those human factors. So here are just some examples. So the first thing is around frameworks. So we've developed uh, uh, our own sort of validation framework that we call the three C's. And this is centered around conformance, completeness, and clinical integrity. 
I think there's lots of different, subtly different frameworks out there. I don't think it sort of matters too much the difference between them. I think it's just important in this to have something that makes sense to your team, that makes sense to stakeholders, that guides the process of validating data. Playbooks in the middle. Playbooks is a huge part of the culture in Google, um, and it's needed because you know things break uh, in opportune times. We don't want to rely on individuals, so things need to be documented very well. And it was great to see a, a talk earlier really emphasizing the importance of good documentation. And then finally, we have responsibilities. So you know, when I think back to some data science projects I might have done in the past, I might have been able to go through a whole data quality cycle of finding an issue, investigating it, finding the root cause, and fixing it you know, all myself without any handovers and anyone else even needing to know about it. In the world of the data platforms, the TREs, this is just not going to be the case. We're going to have different roles, different responsibilities, different end users. So there needs to be organization and coherence around roles and responsibilities. So now onto the technical side. So this is our problem, is that you know, we need to be able to script hundreds of metrics, maybe even thousands, depending on the size of the data platform. We probably need to be running these every day, give or take, depending on the use cases. In our case, we need to be able to deploy and run this for multiple different partners who might have subtly different requirements. And we want to be able to run these metrics in which, in which way that you know, we can actually drill down after the metric is run to find out what's the root cause of the anomaly. And then finally, the last point about highlighting anomalies, it's just not going to be feasible for a human to be reviewing hundreds or thousands of metrics every single day. So we also need a mechanism to direct our attention when something needs looking into. So this is where BigQuery and DBT come into play. So BigQuery, uh, we've of course been using for many years. It's a Google Cloud product, so it's a BigQuery changed my life many years ago. Um, but DBT has only really come into my life very recently, and, and this is kind of how I feel about it. Um, because I still sometimes struggle to articulate to my colleagues exactly what DBT is or what the benefits we're getting. Because on face value, it is kind of simple. It's, the main thing it does is what's described here. It takes your SQL scripts and your Python scripts and it runs them in the right order. So it sounds pretty straightforward, but I, I promise you, if you start using it, it's a lot more transformative than that sounds. And the way I kind of like to think about it is it lets me, as an analyst without a computer science background, be able to build an analytics project in a way that a software engineer might. So building on principles like modularity and testing and version control in a much more sort of easier and reproducible way. So let's get into our DBT project. So DBT projects, you can kind of think of them as this nice little package of various bits of analytics code that are all designed to sort of interact with each other and work together. And there are many different components to this, probably more than that's on this slide. I'll just go through the key ones. So the, the first thing is our metrics themselves. They're the, the meat of our project. We've developed uh, around 180 different data quality metrics over fire data. So these, these range from you know, very straightforward counts, referential integrity metrics, to slightly more involved clinical metrics, like we might calculate things like midnight bed occupancy to validate that that's accurate of uh, the actual state in the hospital. Documentation, I've already stressed the importance of that, so that's where the metadata comes in. So DBT is uh, excellent for providing a very structured way of defining metadata for metrics and tagging metrics, which makes it a lot easier for, for debugging and investigating. In the middle, we have macros, and these are, these are really the, the most powerful parts of this. Um, and I probably don't need to explain to a room of, of Python users you know, the importance of don't repeat yourself and pulling out code that's going to be repeatable into functions. But you know, this isn't something that's natively part of SQL, and it might not be something that people who are often writing SQL queries are used to. Uh, so this really has transformed sort of how I write my SQL queries with, uh, with DBT's <coughs> macros. Um, we've also developed a framework for building patient cohorts, uh, and I'll come to that in a couple of slides. Uh, and then finally, we've built the first version of our anomaly detection model. So this is just uh, a time series model, just using off-the-shelf uh, tooling available in BigQuery. And the idea here is to identify daily metric values that deviate significantly from expectations based on the historical trends. So now that we have our metrics all nicely packaged together into this project, it's as simple as running the command dbt run to just execute this over our entire pipeline. Um, so when we hit dbt run, our metrics will be running over our data platform, the Fire data platform, and persisting outputs into another BigQuery database, our metrics layer. Then from then, the outputs can be easily consumed by any data visualization tool. 
So we've uh, developed a prototype tool in Looker Studio to, develop, uh, to visualize these metrics, but really you could hook this up to any visualization tool that your organization uses or that you prefer to use. So, just got a couple more slides. So for these last two, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit into a bit more of the detail. Um, so on this one, we just have an example macro from the project, uh, has medication request. So we can see here that this is a bit of SQL code that's a little bit convoluted. Um, if anyone's worked with fire data in the past, they might recognize the codable concepts and the need to unnest these nested and repeated fields. Um, so it's a little bit convoluted, and it's also something we're going to want to use again and again. You know, this is a common thing. We want to see if a patient had a, a particular prescription in a given time window. So a good candidate for a macro. So now that we've pulled this out into uh, a macro, we can use this whenever we want to ask that question. For example, when we're constructing a patient cohort. So here we have a SQL query that's trying to extract patient IDs meeting certain criteria. So here, what would have previously, without DVT, been uh, a pretty long and complex query is now about 10 lines of uh, pretty re repeatable and very readable code. So we can see our, our has medication request uh, uh, function there. Uh, and then if you can see at the bottom, it's a little bit faint, um, we then, with a little bit of the sort of DBT magic of how this all stitches together, we can run our whole pipeline uh, over this particular cohort. So again, the DBT run command but this time just providing a, a variable saying I want to run these metrics over the hypertension cohort. And it's these sort of things I found with DBT that it's uh, really excellent for, you know, running subsets of metrics, cohorting, and all of these sort of clever bits that fit together. Um, so finally, just a quick uh, demonstration of a screenshot from the Looker Studio dashboard we've built. So this is the overview page. Uh, and as you can see here, we've just built a few different pages to enable users to uh, explore the latest anomalies from the anomaly detection model or drill down into particular metrics uh, or, or view the metric definitions uh, on the right hand side there. Um, so that's everything today. Thank you very much for your attention. As I said, we're looking to open source this and it's coming very soon. Um, I'd really love it if anybody's interested in any part of this. It, you know, it might be that you have fire data and BigQuery and, and this is perfect, brilliant, get in touch. It might be that you're just interested in DBT and how these reproducible pipelines work. So yeah, please do get in touch uh, and I'll, I'll leave these take-home messages up there and invite questions. Great, round of applause.